Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. event. So Laurie, Laurie Craner is a faculty member at the CMU Institute for Software Research. She directs the Scilab Usable Privacy and Security Lab. She's on the EFF Board of Directors. She's an advisor to Microsoft as part of our Trustworthy Computing Academic Advisory Board. She is also the co-founder of Wombat Security Technology, commercializing some of the anti-phishing technology that she's built, and she's a co-author of a book on usable security and privacy. So I am very excited. Please join me in welcoming Laurie. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, I'm really glad to be here today. Um, and uh, Rob asked me to give a talk, and he said, well, you can talk about any of your research. And um, I, I said, well, any preferences? And then he gave me a whole long list of things. And I said, well, I can't put all of that in one talk. Um, so I'm going to try to actually cram two talks into one, so at least you get some flavor of multiple things. Um, but uh, I, I, will, I have a few slides that just have brief references and mentions of other things. And if you want to know more about those, you can ask me about them later. Um, so today we're going to focus on cyber trust indicators. Um, so what are they? This is kind of my uh, umbrella term for any sort of symbol of security, privacy, or trust that will show up in a browser or in software. Um, and so within scope here are things like pop-up warnings, symbols in the browser Chrome, um, privacy seals, privacy policies. These all fall under this umbrella. All right. There are a lot of uses for cyber trust indicators. Um, one use is uh, if there's a potential hazard, it's an alert about the hazard. Um, another use um, has to do with indicating some reputation, trust, validation, something along those lines. Um, and sometimes these are used to facilitate decision making. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, two projects that we've done at CMU. Um, and one of them deals with um, alerting about potential hazards. So this is SSL certificate warnings. Um, and the other one is about facilitating decision making. And this has to do with privacy policies. Um, so that's what you'll hear about today. OK, so talking about hazards. Um, this is one of my favorite hazard photos. Um, this is actually the sidewalk in front of my house. Um, it actually, well, it used to be the sidewalk in front of my house. Um, the city of Pittsburgh actually informed me that this is a hazard. Um, and um, I got a, a court summons, um, failure to repair my sidewalk. I had to go in front of a judge and plead not guilty. But anyway, um, uh, by the time I went in front of the judge, I, of course, had done something about this hazard. So uh, what, what should we do about hazards? Well, the best solution is what I actually did. I removed the hazard. Um, but there are a lot of other things that you can do when you have a hazard. Um, the next best solution, and this is what I did until I had the contractor come out, was I just guarded against the hazard. Um, and, um, and, and that, that's, you know, often a good solution. Um, not as good as getting rid of it, but it's still reasonably good. But it still can be costly. You know, these guys don't want to sit out there 24-7. And so the, the other solution, of course, is just to warn about the hazard. And it's Pittsburgh, so they're union, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can warn about the hazard. And um, obviously, I just Photoshopped that on, but then, um, <laughs> I was walking around my neighborhood, and I discovered that, in fact, people are doing that. <laughs> um, so yeah, that is real. That's a few blocks from my house. Um, OK, so, so uh, th th this is what people do about real life hazards. And I've actually uh, spent a bit of time reading the hazard literature. Um, there's actually a whole, whole uh, branch of psychology that deals with hazards. And, um, and these people study like what color should railroad crossing signs be, and what font should you put on medicine bottles, and things like that. Um, and you know, one of the things that they talk about is this kind of hazard hierarchy, exactly like I've shown you. Um, all right, so how does this apply to um, computer security warnings? Um, well, so, so the warnings that we see in our software um, uh, indicate that there's a possible security hazard and it triggers a warning. 
Um, and uh, often our warnings are confusing, and there are a lot of false positives, and people tend to ignore them. And so what happens is sometimes when there really is a hazard, it's dangerous, and people actually are injured by the hazard. Um, so uh, just to give you an example, um, here is a typical uh, security warning. Um, and um, when users see that, this is what they actually read. <laughs> um, so they swat it away. <laughs> OK, so, um, so what we've been looking at in our research is um, it's processes that can help us do something better. Um, and we've come up with a process which is in a paper called um, The Human in the Loop, um, which you can take a look at. Um, and it's the human threat identification and mitigation process. And the idea here is if you have a secure system that is relying on humans to do something um, uh, useful in order to protect their security, uh, we'd like to model the, that human as a threat, um, the, the good human. Um, as a threat, not, not just the evil attacker. Uh, and so in order to do this, the first thing we need to do is to identify what exactly is the security task that we're expecting humans to do. Um, and I think this is a step that people often don't really think about. Um, and, and so uh, I, I think it's really important. And, and uh, an, another person in the, in the usable security community tells me that when she uh, consults with companies, she, she has them do this. And she says, get out a piece of paper, blank 8.5 by 11 piece of paper, and write down what are all the security tasks you're asking people to do. And she says when they fill up that piece of paper, she tells them that they're in trouble and they need to start over. Um, because you can't rely on humans to do this many things. Um, but, but the first step is to actually enumerate what are these tasks that you're expecting humans to do. Once you've done that, you can then go through them and say, do I really need a human to do each of these things? Are there things here in the, are there tasks here that I could actually automate or partially automate to somehow lessen the burden on the user to do these tasks? Um, and then once I've done that, I see what's left, and I want to see, OK, are these tasks that humans are good at or things that they're likely going to fail to do? Um, and so we want to identify failures. And the human in the loop model actually has a whole uh, set of steps to try to identify those failures. Um, and you might need to do some user studies to find out whether people are actually good or not so good at some of these things. Then once you know where the failures are, you try to figure out how to mitigate the failures, and then you may do some looping. Uh, where there may be some things that you felt uh, were, were too hard to automate at first, but once you realized how bad people were at them, now automation suddenly looks a lot better. Okay, so now we can apply this process to warnings. So in this case, the task is to decide whether I should stop doing what I'm doing and pay attention to this warning, or whether I should swat it away and keep doing what I'm doing. That, that's the task we're asking the human. Um, and and uh, uh, if we wanted to, we, we could automate. We, we could get rid of that warning and have the computer decide either there's a hazard or there's not. And if there's a hazard, the computer just doesn't let the human proceed. And if there's not a hazard, then the computer lets the human proceed and doesn't say anything. Um, so uh, we, hopefully there, there's uh, some good reason why we're bothering to interrupt the human here. And there's something that, that we can't completely automate here. Um, OK. so. Um, the current situation looks something like this. Um, unfortunately, um, often what happens is software developers are in a situation where there might be something dangerous, and they decide, well, I want the human to decide. I don't know if it's really dangerous or not. Um, so we have this big gray area. And so what we'd like to have happen is that we want to use some automation to make this gray area smaller. If we can kind of cut away at the edges and find the cases where we really can automate and decide it's safe or it's not safe. Okay, so we make it smaller. So now we have some situations where we don't have to bother the user because it's really probably not a hazard or where we just want to block and really not let them decide. Um, and then for what's left in that gray area, now we want to have better messaging to the user so that they um, can actually understand what question they're being asked and make a, a really sensible decision. So um, an example of how you might change the question, okay, here's a bad question. Your web browser thinks this is a phishing website. Do you want to go there anyway? Um, and you know, your typical user may not know what a phishing site is, and of course they want to go to that site. What, you know, this is a silly question, and they're just going to click through and go to the site. Um, you could rephrase this. 
you are trying to go to evilsite.com. Do you really want to go there, or would you rather go to yourbank.com? Aha, I want to go to my bank. I don't want to go to evil site. All right, so this is a much better question. Now, in order to ask this question, we have to do more automation behind the scenes because we have to figure out where the user really wants to go. And this may be a non-trivial thing to figure out. Um, and this process itself may be attackable by the attacker. Um, and so we need, we need to, to deal with that. Um, but this is kind of what, what we're aiming for, is we want to be able to, to actually uh, reduce when we need to ask the user at all, and when we ask them, ask a better question. Okay, so uh, this led us to study um, browser certificate warnings and to see if we could apply this sort of process to improving them. Um, so this was work uh, that was done by a bunch of my students, um, including uh, Serge Egelman, um, who many of you know. Okay, so um, looking at browser certificate warnings, there's a whole bunch of different types of things that web browsers warn about related to certificates, and these include things like domain mismatch, unknown certificate authority, and expired certificates. Um, and on the one hand, most of the time when you get a certificate warning, there is not actually a hazard that you need to worry about. On the other hand, sometimes there is. Um, and so we would like to be able to distinguish those cases. Okay, so uh, this is an example of the Firefox 2 certificate warning. And uh, you can see there's a lot of text. Um, and um, you know, the most natural thing is to just say OK and to ignore the warning. Okay. Um, and, and that, that gives you, you know, what people actually read. Okay, uh, the IE7 warning, um, and this has less text, um, but still not, not really all that informative to people. Um, the Firefox 3 warning is actually really interesting. Um, so there's no buttons. Right? You can't easily swat it away. Um, what you have to do is you have to click on that link on the bottom, which says, or you can add an exception. Um, and then that opens it up, and then you can add an exception. And then you get this um, box, and you have to click on the Get Certificate. Um, and then you finally get to say uh, Confirm Security Exception. And then you can finally go to your website. Okay, so that, that's a multi-step process. OK, so um, we decided to, to conduct a laboratory study um, to see how people reacted to these three different warnings. And my students also tried their hand at coming up with their own warnings. And so they invented two warnings that I'll show you in a minute. So we had five different warnings that we were testing. Um, and uh, we had 100 participants. Um, and each, each participant was assigned to a condition where they saw one of these five warnings. Um, and they were assigned to do a bunch of, of web surfing tasks. And during that process, the warnings were triggered um, twice, once at a high security site and once at a low security site. Okay. All right, so these are the, the two warnings that my students um, made up. This is the first one. Um, uh, so here they decided to really focus on making the risk itself very obvious. So they turned the warning red so that it would uh, really stand out. Um, and it, they made the headline high risk of security compromise. And if you um, read the text, if you read the text of the warning um, in detail, it actually explains in, in reasonably easy to understand language exactly what's going on here. Um, the, the second warning that, that they came up with is this um, ask a user a question warning. And so here it says, the website responding to your request failed to provide verifiable identification. What type of website are you trying to reach? And there's a choice of different types of websites. And um, if they say bank or other financial institution, then we show them this. And if they say any of the other things, then we just let them proceed to the website. So the idea is to try to get at, is, are they actually in danger? If not, we're not going to bother them. If they are, now we want to stop them in their tracks. Okay. So the way the uh, laboratory study worked is that um, the uh, people were given, oops, now my phone decides to go back. OK. okay. Um, people were given a bunch of tasks one at a time. Um, and uh, most of these were actually um, uh, distractor tasks. Um, but the two that we cared about were they had to go to their online bank account, log in, and find um, their bank balance, and just tell us the last two digits. Um, and they needed to look up a, a uh, book in the CMU library catalog. Um, and when they did those tasks, a warning was going to appear. Um, now, for each task, we also provided an alternate task. 
Um, and the idea was that if we told them your task is to go find your bank account number, then they were likely to one way or another find their bank account number, even if they were concerned about the warning. And so we wanted to have another route so that if they were concerned, they could do something else instead. Um, and so in this case, uh, the, the alternate task was we gave them the, um, the phone number for online banking at their bank, and there was a phone provided right there, and we said you should use the phone to find out. Okay. So here is uh, an example of how the task worked. We gave them a, a separate sheet of paper that had the task on it. I had the alternate task, so you can see the phone number is right there. Um, and we asked them to think aloud so that we could see what they were doing as, as they did the task. Um, so it looked something like this. They, they opened up the web browser. They typed in their bank's URL. Um, and so th th this was uh, one of our custom um, warning conditions. Um, so they would get the warning. And then if they just chose to ignore the warning, they would go to their, to their bank account and log in. Um, and if they chose um, not to ignore the warning, they would click the Get Me Out of Here button, and then they'd pick up the phone and they'd call their bank. Okay. So we had a number of hypotheses that we were testing here. Um, the first one was that the IE7 and Firefox 2 warnings we thought would be largely ignored by users. Um, we thought that they were more likely to obey the Firefox 3 warning because it was so complicated, as well as um, the warnings that we created. Um, and we thought that the multi-page warning, they would be more likely to obey on the bank website, where it actually was going to put up that full stop. And on the, on the library website, um, where they were going to see it, uh, that was going to be a low-risk website. And so they would probably just go ahead and go, and go to the library. And incidentally, at the CMU library, um, they have a self-signed certificate. So CMU students are used to always swatting away a certificate whenever they go to the CMU library. OK, so here are the results in the bank account. Um, so what we found um, was that in the risky situation at the online bank account, that um, the Firefox 2 and the IE7 users, for the most part, ignored the warning, um, which is actually quite dangerous, because this was their real online bank account. Um, and you know, they, they had no way of knowing um, you know, what we might have done to the computer that they were using. Um, in reality, all we did was actually we, re we removed the root certificate from the browser, and so it triggered warnings. But they didn't know what we had done. Um, so then for the library, uh, what we see is that actually um, people largely ignored uh, the warning just about everywhere, except in Firefox 3. Um, and Firefox 3 was very interesting. They wanted to ignore the warning in Firefox 3. They just couldn't figure out how. <laughs> <laughs> well, because over the years, we've actually trained our users to look for the OK button. And they've been trained fairly well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and when we did this test, Firefox 3 had just been out um, a short amount of time. And people hadn't been trained to know what to do to, to override it. And it, it is significantly more complicated. Um, so we also compared. Uh, the library versus the bank. Um, and what we can see is that in, um, in, in the, the three native warning conditions that we tested, there's actually no statistically significant difference in behavior between the library and the bank. So users are not differentiating between a risky situation and a non-risky situation. Um, but with the new warnings that we created, we actually got people to make that differentiation. Um, so we also dug down a little bit to see if we could understand more of what was going on. And we had, this was a think aloud, so we have a lot of uh, information about what they said as they went. And then we also surveyed them after they finished all the tasks. Um, so um, one of the things uh, uh, we asked them about was, you know, why did they, they choose to do what they did with the warnings? Um, and we, we coded their answers. And what we found was that in the three, um, the three native warnings, um, very few people mentioned anything about risk. But in our single page warning condition, almost everybody mentioned risk. Um, and so there was clearly um, a, a difference as far as whether the warning was communicating that there was something risky or not. Um, we also asked them, well, what did you think the warning wanted you to do? Now, you would think this is obvious what the warning wanted you to do, but in fact, it wasn't. And, um, and most people did not say that they thought the warning wanted them to not proceed, which just seems like such an obvious choice, and yet they didn't say that. Yeah. Doesn't the IE7 have a recommended with a little green check and a not recommended with red? Mm -hmm. And that's in IE7, and people didn't see it. Yeah, and so we, we didn't have the warning in front of them when, when they answered this question. It's just what they remembered, and yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
So uh, yeah, the, the, these warnings were not clear about what it is that they should do. Um, we did note that the Firefox 3 approach of making it difficult seemed somewhat effective, um, that people couldn't figure out how to do it, um, although half of them could figure out how to override it. So there was only so far that that went. Um, uh, another interesting thing about, about the, it is that there was a lot of confusion. So this is the Firefox 3 warning, and this is a, a 404 warning in Firefox. And um, you'll, you'll notice that there, there, you know, there are some similarities. They both have yellow things in the corner. All right, apparently that was enough to confuse users. Um, a lot of people just said, oh, that looks kind of like that. Um, and and they, di they didn't actually realize what the warning was. Um, OK, what about our approach of asking a question? Um, so uh, this had mixed results. Um, so at the bank, only 15 out of 20 people correctly answered. OK, did they not know that they were at a bank? Yeah, yeah, they knew. Three of them knowingly gave the wrong answer because they realized that if they gave the right answer, we were going to block them. Um, <laughs> all right, and two of them were just confused and didn't actually read the question itself and just randomly click something. OK. Um, <laughs> Now, it also turns out that there are some vulnerabilities um, in, in this approach. And in our paper, um, uh, we described this finer grained origins attack, which um, we submitted this to Usenix Security. And they accepted it conditionally that um, the, the program committee had identified this finer grained origins, origins attack. And they said, you must write about it in your paper, which we did. Um, so there are some pro other problems as well. Um, so um, on the one hand, you know, if you look at the numbers, wow, we had a 50% improvement. But on the other hand, half the people still, had this been real, would have been a victim of, of an attack at, at their online bank, um, which suggests that this isn't good enough. Um, so it's kind of a mixed result. Um, it suggests that having a context-sensitive approach is going to be useful, but this isn't it. Yeah. I'm not sure I agree that this is an improvement. I mean, what is the base? What is the base? You know, um, you know, um, occurrence of of people being attacked with you know bad certificates in the wild. I mean, I think you know, your three people here who knowingly give the right answer would seem to me to be saying, I know from experience that my computer does random stuff all the time. I don't trust it to give it. You know, it blocks me from doing stuff that where I know better than it a lot of the time. And in this instance, they were right. No. Well, so, so our feeling was that um, at, at websites that are not their bank, they're, they're probably right. But, but really, if you, you should not see a warning when you're going to your bank. Right, but my point would be that you know, your average user has seen certificate errors in his lifetime, and he has never once ever seen... Um, a, a yeah, I, 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 I absolutely agree with that. <laughs> what our argument is that, 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 that once in a lifetime, when you see the warning at your bank, it should stop you, and these warnings are not stopping you. Right, but, it, but it's, it's not unreasonable that people have been trained to... That, and, and, that, and that's why we're trying to change the warnings and say, can we, by using a different kind of warning, actually get people to, to stop when it happens at their bank? And what we found is we can improve the odds, but not enough. But, 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 but that's the constraint. If, if you just want to do that, then the answer is clear. You just block the connection. That may be the right thing for, for developers to do, and that's something you all should think about. <laughs> yeah. But is it possible that it's just the novelty of the ones you designed? If they, if you had them use it for a year, they would have started ignoring our uh, It's entirely possible. Um, yeah, it, it is entirely possible that that. Uh, so you know, we're already saying up front that we saw only a small improvement, and we don't think it's good enough. And it may be that over time, our small improvement would even minimize. Yeah, um, I think I, I suspect that that at the that at the end of the year you would still see a small improvement, but it would actually be even smaller than than uh, what we showed. Um, okay, so our conclusion from this study um, is that you know basically we have a problem. Yes, you can improve the wording of warnings. Um, but in many cases, that's probably not good enough. Um, and so you know, think about the sidewalk. You know, we could spray paint the word warning in bigger letters, but is this really the right solution to the problem? Um, and so I think we need to have some rethinking about the whole solution and not just focus on, okay, let's, let's just reword the warning. 
Um, there are some, some uh, research systems that are out there that are trying different approaches. Um, so in our paper, we talk about perspectives and forced HTTPS, um, which are kind of academic research uh, solutions. Um, perspectives is a system that other people at CMU, not me, uh, have been working on, where basically there is um, uh, a uh, server that keeps track of, um, of certificate warnings and, and certificates uh, from websites. And so basically, uh, your, your browser contacts the server and says, well, I just got this certificate. Is it the same one that you've seen? And if lots of other people have seen that certificate, it's assumed to be a good one. But if suddenly you're getting a different certificate than other people have gotten, then you should question the validity of the certificate. Um, so that's an interesting approach. Um, there hasn't really been research into the false positive rates you get with that um, or the usability of it, but it seems like an interesting direction to look at. Okay, um, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk about privacy policies, unless there are any other questions before I... Okay, um, okay so a nutrition label for privacy. Um, so this is, uh, again, work done with a bunch of students at CMU. Um, Patrick Kelly uh, kind of took the lead on this. Um, so we start with the notion that um, lots of privacy surveys have been done, and the privacy surveys always point to um, privacy as a value that people really want. Um, they say it's very important. Um, and then if you w observe behavior, you find that people often take steps that seem to contradict how much they value privacy, um, that they often seem to be quite willing to give up their privacy for small rewards. Um, and so there's been a lot written about why that is. Um, and some people say, well, maybe people don't really care much about privacy after all. Um, and that's you know, certainly a possibility. Um, there are other people who say, well, you know, maybe there's this you know, immediate gratification thing that, that uh, you know, I want that candy bar now, and you know, privacy is a long-term uh, thing. You know, my, I won't actually see the impact of the privacy invasion for some time far out in the future. That's a possibility too. Um, there are two other possibilities, and that's the focus of our work here. One is that they don't actually understand the privacy implications of their behavior. And two is that they don't actually understand the, the privacy policy that they're dealing with, that it's actually very time consuming to read and understand privacy policies and to inform yourself about what's going on. Um, so you know, the theory behind privacy policies is that they are informative of consumers and that consumers can read them and then vote with their feet. If they're at a company that has a bad privacy policy, they should just not shop there. They should go somewhere else. Um, the problem is, is that it's been well documented that most privacy policies require very advanced reading skills to actually understand. They take a long time to read. Um, and so nobody is reading them. Um, and so they're pretty much um, ineffective uh, for this role. They're, they're actually, there's still a lot of things that are good about privacy policies, but if you're expecting them to, to be used by consumers to make decisions, that's not happening. Um, one of my students actually did a study where she said, okay, well, let's just pretend everybody really does read privacy policies. Let, let, let's see what would happen here. Um, and so she did some calculations and assume, got some data about the average number of websites that people visit, um, average salaries, things like that. You know, and she found that it would take you 244 hours a year to read, your pri read a privacy policy at every site you visit once a month. Right? That's ridiculous. Um, and then if you put the dollar amounts on it, it gets even more ridiculous. Um, so, uh, you know, e even if people wanted to read privacy policies, we can see that it, it's just ridiculous to think that people would actually do that. Okay, so then we looked at, all right, is there anything that we can do to put privacy policies in a format that would make them more accessible? Um, and so we did a study um, where we looked at a bunch of different privacy policy formats. Um, we looked at the, the full standard long privacy policy formats. We looked at the layered notice privacy policy. Um, we looked at some things my students came up with. Um, and uh, we, we did, did this for a number of different real websites. Um, we basically found a bunch of real websites. Some had long privacy policies, some had short ones. We took out all the brand names so that they anonymized them. We put them all in the same font. Um, we put them in these different formats. Um, and we asked people to read the policy in you know, one policy in one format 
and answer a bunch of reading comprehension questions, and then a bunch of questions about how much they enjoyed the experience they just had. <laughs> uh, what we found is that um, people had a, a really tough time with this. Um, they, the very simple question, so it, all of the companies we named Acme. So does Acme use cookies? OK, 98% of the people could actually answer that question. Um, but anything that re required any reading comprehension was very difficult for people across the board. Um, and even the well-written policies, we picked some that we felt like, you know, this company has a really nice, concise, easy to understand policy, and we threw those in the mix. And even those people didn't really like that much, and they still found difficult to do. Um, and we found that this idea of layered policies wasn't really helping either. So this was kind of... Um, uh, depressing. <laughs> you know, lot, lots of different efforts to try to improve privacy policies, and we're finding that they're pretty much universally hated. Uh, so then we did some studies to look at, well, what if you give people privacy information in the search engine? Um, so we built this thing called Privacy Finder, and you can check it out at privacyfinder.org. Um, although we, we just tried it earlier today. It's very slow right now um, because its cache is broken, but uh, next week, hopefully it will be faster. Um, but anyway, we built this search engine that the search results come back annotated with a privacy meter. So you can see at a glance when you do a search um, which of the search results has good privacy and which one has bad privacy. Um, and we did some lab studies where we, we paid people to go shopping um, and we set up the studies so that the search results that had good privacy were also sold products that were more expensive. And so we could test whether people would actually pay more for good privacy. And we actually found that they will, um, as long as it's not too much. But in the 50 cents range, we actually found people would pay more for good privacy on, on a $10 purchase. Um, so, so this actually uh, was one of the first studies to demonstrate that, that uh, people may actually be willing to pay for privacy if you make it really blatantly obvious to them which company has a better privacy policy? Um, Did they translate privacy to safety? <coughs> or they thought because it was more private, it was safer, and that's why? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, one of the things that we did in the study is there was a, an exit interview, and we asked them, you know, what do you think it meant for them to have a good score on the privacy meter? And we did find that there were, um, uh, there were some people who, who uh, associated it with safety, security, um, I'm not going to have my credit card stolen, things like that. Um, now, they did have an opportunity, if they wanted to, to click on the privacy meter and find out what it meant. Um, but very few people actually did that. Most of them just sort of accepted, high privacy, great, and didn't actually click through to see what high privacy actually means. Um, so anyway, we did a bunch of these studies. We, we uh, tried it with different types of items. We tried it um, with different types of conditions. We, we also checked to see, um, was the, the meter itself attractive? Maybe it had nothing to do with privacy, but it's a high level on some meter. Um, so we, we tested it with meters that mean other things. Um, and we found that actually, no, it, privacy was, was scoring more highly than other things. OK, so uh, then we said, all right, well, Let's go back to this privacy policy problem and see, can we actually make a better one? Um, and um, we, we looked to the nutrition label literature um, for some insights here. Um, and nutrition labels um, are not perfect either. They, they have their, their criticism as well. But there are a lot of really nice things about nutrition labels. Um, so I can take two uh, products and put them side by side, and I can easily see you know, which one has more calories and which one has more fat and calcium or whatever. And if I have particular dietary concerns, I've gone to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, you need to watch your cholesterol now, I can now start looking at the cholesterol box on the nutrition label. And it may be that I never paid any attention to cholesterol before, but now that I know that, that that's something I need to look at, I can very easily learn how to find cholesterol on there, and I can do that comparison. Um, and uh, so the reason that this works is because it's a very standardized format. Um, it uses standardized language. And it's also fairly brief, and it's linked to more information. So I can actually get all of the ingredients. Now, this is not very, a very interesting example because the only ingredient is milk. But um, in, in, uh, there are other examples where there's actually a very lengthy ingredient list. Um, and uh, it may be that after you've seen the summary, you still want to know whether there's some particular ingredient that is in there. And you can actually go and read the whole ingredient list and find it. 
Okay, so um, we looked at a bunch of other types of consumer labels, um, energy labels, drug facts, water ratings, all sorts of things like that. Um, we looked at the literature in this area about how these types of things were developed, um, and that gave us a lot of insights. Um, now, in the privacy case, we had a number of challenges. Um, one is that people are not actually familiar with privacy terminology. Um, now, of course, the same thing could be said about nutrition. Um, before nutrition labels, most people didn't know what a trans fat is, and you know, still people may not know what a trans fat is, but we're still able to use the nutrition label. Um, there were also uh, issues that of sort of the cross-product problem. It's not enough to know what data they collect what they use data for. You need to know that you use this data element for this purpose. So that cross product becomes actually very important. Um, another challenge is that privacy policies tend to actually be fairly complex. Um, and people don't really understand the implications of these privacy practices. So we did an iterative design process. Um, that actually was a multi-year process uh, involved doing focus groups, lab studies, online studies. And in, the, in these um, studies, we measured um, reading comprehension, how accurately they could answer questions, how long it took to find information, um, how easy it was to compare multiple policies, and then of subjective opinions about things like ease, fun, trust, and enjoyment. Okay. So this was one of our first attempts. Um, this was actually designed by Rob Reeder. Um, and um, uh, this, this was in Rob's thesis. Uh, what we did here is we took the P3P uh, language and we took every element in the P3P language and tried to cram it into one table. Um, and it may look like that to you. Um, this is actually the collapsed view. Um, some of you may know Rob did work on expandable grids. And so you could expand this and then it was even more crazy. Um, it has, uh, I think, no fewer than 11 different symbols of various shades of teal. Um, <laughs> and um, it won't surprise you that when we did the user study to test it, it was a complete disaster. Um, and uh, uh, we wrote a paper about it anyway. Um, and it, this, this was um, you know, a lessons from failure kind of paper. Um, but we did actually learn a lot from, from doing this. Um, and actually, I must say that there actually are a few good things about this, um, one of which is that people who wanted to uh, create P3P policies, policy authors, actually really liked this and said this would be a great authoring tool because I can find all the elements I want to put in my P3P policy, and if I could just kind of toggle them, then I could um, create my P3P policy. Um, but for readers, people who wanted to find out about a site's policy, this was just kind of overwhelming. All right, so um, we, did, uh, we, we did a lot of uh, interviews with people about this and tried to understand um, what their problems were with it. And then um, we did an iterative uh, process where we um, tried lots of different approaches. So after this, the first reaction was to go complete opposite end of the pendulum. Let's do something very, very simple. Um, and so uh, Patrick Kelly had come up with that one, which is based very closely on nutrition facts. Um, then we said, OK, we've gone too far here. Let's go back to a grid, but a simpler grid. Um, so that's what we had here. Um, and then um, w there, were, there were a lot of feedback um, about this grid. Um, and one thing is people wanted color. So color came back here, um, lots of different changes. And then we finally ended up here the evolution. And there were actually a bunch of others in between. There were lots of minor variants that, that we uh, tested separately. Um, and uh, our tests were done uh, with informal focus groups for some of these small variants. We also used Mechanical Turk. Um, and it, that was really good to be able to take, OK, we have two subtle variations. Let's throw them both up on Mechanical Turk, get 50 users to, to uh, use them. And we can very quickly decide which variants we, sh we should pursue and which ones not. Okay, so uh, zooming in so you can actually see this a bit more. Um, this, this is actually not the very final one, but this is the one that we tested. Um, so you can see across the top, we have how we use your information um, and who, with 
who we share your information with, and down the side we have types of information. Um, and then we have these colored cells to show you um, whether the information is going to be used in that way all the time or in an opt-in or opt-out basis. Now this is all generated automatically from P3P policies, um, but it doesn't have to be. You could manually generate this for a company. Um, but in Privacy Finder, we actually are automatically generating these now. Um, and then if you scroll down, um, we actually have the key to show what the symbols mean. And then there's a glossary, and the glossary actually goes on beyond this. But all of the terms used on the page are in the glossary. OK, so first we did um, some focus groups. Um, and that helped us uh, zero in on, on the actual terminology that we used and some of the issues with symbols and colors and things like that. Um, and then we did a laboratory study with 24 participants. Um, and we had them basically go through and do a bunch of reading comprehension tasks uh, with the policy in the lab. Um, doing it in the lab allowed us to observe exactly how people were manipulating the policies um, and, and do that think aloud and get their feedback that way. So that was a soups paper. Um, then we uh, refined the, um, the nutrition label based on that feedback, and we did an online study with 763 participants. Um, and this was done uh, using mTurk. Um, in this case, we had five conditions that we tested, um, and I'll show you them in a minute. And um, we, for all conditions, we, we measured the same things that we'd been measuring before. Okay, so um, this was our standardized label. Um, and so this looks very similar to what I just showed you, except the exclamation points are gone now and there's some minor wording changes. Um, and so, so th this was, um, our, our hypothesis was this was going to be the best solution. Um, one thing that we were interested in was do we really need the empty rows? Uh, and so we did a version where we took out all the empty rows so that we could test that as well. And so that was our short standardized label. Um, then somebody asked us, well, you know, now that you've standardized it, maybe the grid isn't so exciting. Maybe text standardized would be just as good. Um, in fact, uh, that was uh, some criticism we'd gotten on the soups paper is you didn't actually test text. So we um, then generated our standardized short text. Basically, we took the standardized short table and turned it into text. Every, every row and column you know, became a sentence, and we put it all together here. Um, so that's our standardized short text. Um, we also tested the um, layered text. So this is um, something that's being done um, in the industry. There are a number of uh, companies, uh, including Microsoft, who have layered notices, sometimes known as highlights notices. Um, and so we just took an actual one that was out there, and we just changed the name of the company to Acme. But we used all their formatting and everything. Um, and okay, we also tested the, the full policy, which I don't have an example here. Um, we had four real companies, and we created um, five versions of their policy um, using all these different versions. Okay, so in our mTurk study, we started by asking people demographic questions. We asked them some questions about their views of um, their use of the internet and their views of privacy. Um, then we had simple tasks where they could answer it by looking at one row or one column in the table. Um, so does Acme use cookies as an example. Um, then we had complex tasks where they had to look at the combination of a row and column in order to answer the question. Um, then we asked them um, how much they enjoyed this experience. Um, then we gave them comparison tasks where they looked at two policies side by side. And we, we actually set up a browser where, where, so they could actually look at two policies. Um, and answer some questions about that. And then we asked them about their enjoyment of, um, of doing the comparison tasks. OK, so overall, um, if you look at all of the um, accuracy tests that we did, um, what you see is that the three standardized formats all do much better than the full policy and the layered test. And there's actually um, very few statistically significant differences between the three standardized formats and very few statistically significant differences between the other two formats. Um, but between each other, the, the blue is statistically different than the red. Um, so what's going on? Um, OK, so overall, we see standardized formats outperform text and layered. Um, it seems like there's a big advantage to having standardization, um, having a structured presentation. 
um, and having uh, clear, clear terminology, having, um, uh, having the glossary, so having definitions. Um, all of these things seem to contribute to people being able to actually um, understand the policy and uh, use it more quickly. Um, between the standardized formats, we saw only minor differences. Um, the, the table versus the text, we see that the table does give you a more holistic view. And so for some of the questions, we saw people were able to perform a bit better because of that holistic view. Um, we found that the short table takes up less space. And for some questions, therefore, you can actually answer it faster because there's less that you, know, you can ignore. But there were some questions that it tripped people up, especially if, if it was about those missing rows. Um, it was then harder for people to find that information. Uh, we found that the text one, um, in general, worked pretty well. But there were some questions where the answer was in the middle of a paragraph. And people didn't do as well as on those questions um, because they had to find text in the middle of a paragraph. And for a complicated policy, the text one, is you're going to have more sentences in a complicated policy. And so it's going to get longer. And so it actually doesn't scale well for a complicated policy. Um, and that's not a problem that you have with the table because the table is always going to be the same size. Yeah? Does having a, a very constrained data format like that limit the amount of communication you can have? I mean, it seems in this test that your the sorts of privacy things that users were asked to look up were very well known. As sort of technology marches forward, new uh, privacy risks come up. I don't know, flash cookies, something like that. I want to know this idea. Flash cookies. There's not a box for it. There's not a standard for it. Is that? It seems like just open text it at least gives you the opportunity to put in arbitrary data. Right. Well, so in in, in um. In our standardized text, you don't have that opportunity, but in full open text, you do. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is a trade-off. So um, uh, if you want to have everything, it's not going to be standardized, and it's not going to be compact. Um, and our notion is that you use the standardized format as the first look and that you allow people to drill down. Um, one of the things that we're currently working on is making it so you could click on the cell and then that would tell you more information. So if you say, wanted to know, well, is it regular cookies or is it flash cookies? You could click on the cookie cell and then get, get more information. Going back, going back to the previous presentation, a sort of interesting interaction with like your, your experiment where you're uh, uh, giving the user where they think they, they think there should be going to bank.com and evilsite.com, that example. There's sort of interesting privacy applications with things like that around, well, if you do something funny, you're going to need to send me your URL or path or something like that. But if you're not doing anything funny, then you won't. And describing those sort of more complicated, like maybe you'll send me your URLs, maybe you'll send me your ID. Um, those sort of uh, conditional privacy considerations, is, is there any way to represent those? Yeah, so we, we have looked at that some. So um, as I said, this was actually generated from a P3P policy. And um, the P3P policy allows you to actually have multiple, what's called a statement on the site. And so you can say, well, for when you're logged in, this is what we do. When you're not logged in, this is what we do. And, and so these are separate statements. And so you could actually generate a separate grid for each statement. And, and we've experimented with that. And a typical site has like three to five statements. And now you have three to five statements on the screen. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at is having um, tabs. And so when you hit the site, you see the composite statement, which is what we've been showing you. But then you see the tabs if you want to look at. So then you see the tab for you know, when you're not logged in. And I can click over to that and say, OK, what are they doing when I'm not logged in? Um, or something along those lines. It's something we're experimenting with. Yeah, Jeff. Tell me again, will your test subjects work? Um, so for this study, it was um, mechanical turkers. <laughs> so, um, so Amazon has this uh, system where you can crowdsource that basically you can put up uh, tasks and say, you know, I'll pay you 50 cents to do a task and, and people who are bored come to this site and, you know, get paid 50 cents to spend. With education levels they have? Well, we actually we asked, we asked demographic questions so that we could find out. And so what was the demographics? Um, it, it's actually a, a pretty, pretty good cross-section of people um, skewed towards a younger demographic. Um, uh, it's mostly people under 50, but you get a pretty good range of occupations. And I asked that simply because of the difference between, say, a table versus the text and you know, privacy text tends to get complex all by itself. Yeah, um, we had a mix of educational backgrounds. Uh, you know, if you look at you know U.S. Census data versus this, this is more educated than U.S. Census. Uh, but if you look at um, you know internet users in general, I, I think this is a reasonable cross section of internet users. 
So. Yeah. Um, very small minority people ever, ever click on the link to get to the privacy statement. Did you ever say, if the privacy statement had one of these formats, would you be more apt to click on the privacy statement to learn more about it? Yeah, um, we, we did have something uh, to the effect of if, if all privacy policies looked like this, I'd be more likely to read privacy policies. Um, and I think the, the only useful data from that is a comparison between formats because I don't believe it when people say they're going to actually look at it. But we, but we want to compare across formats. Um, and so you know, the people who had the standardized formats you know, were said they would be more likely to read it than the, the other people. But. That's about, that's about all I could take away from it because in, until you actually put people in that situation, I don't think you'd really know. Yeah? One of the things that I think really works in the nutrition labels that kind of almost works here is that like for, for, for the nutrition label stuff, I, I scan only the two or three fields that I'm really interested in and there's very little wiggle room in interpretation of you know, how much cholesterol there is in this. This is very, whereas with the table here, right, I mean, I looked at the, 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 the information you're giving and I, and I guess you're just parsing what they give. But what I really want to know when I'm looking at the thing is, okay, you're going to use my email for marketing. Does that mean like once a week, once a month, you know, three times a day? I mean, it makes uh, how much of this I'm going to be seeing from you, and and, and I guess that's you know that's not really in their policy. You, yeah, I don't know any. I don't know any website privacy policy that tells you that information. But it, but isn't it, yeah um, yeah. I guess that's the kind yeah, I mean, there are other things people say. I want to know what company are they going to share my data with. Yeah. Nobody will tell you that. Which is, yeah. I mean, so we're only going with what, what we have. But, but I agree. I'd, I'd like to have that, too. Yeah. this presentation. So if you can grab the data out of the privacy statements, I in the browser say, this is what my minimums. Now block me from sites that don't meet that minimum. Yes, yes. Actually, that's where we started. Um, if we go, wind back in history. Um, so I was involved in developing the P3P specification at W3C. And um, we, we talked in the working group about what, what could people do with P3P. Um, and we came up with um, a sketch of what it should look like. And then Microsoft implemented something else in IE. Um, and so we decided to um, go ahead and build a prototype of what we thought P3P might do. And I worked for AT&T at the time. And so we built an IE plugin called Privacy Bird. And um, Privacy Bird let you set your personal privacy preferences. And then every time you went to a website, it looked for the P3P policy. And if it matched your preferences, then you got this green singing happy bird in the corner of your browser. And if it didn't match it, you got this red angry bird in the corner of your browser. Um, and uh, uh, we, we, with, and we didn't actually implement this option, but, but uh, the intention was that you could also even say, you know, just you know, put up a block page, don't even let me go there. Um, but the, the red bird calling at you was pretty disconcerting to people. Um, <laughs> so uh, so, so that, that's, that's kind of you know, how we, we started with this. Um, we, we have a notion with, with Privacy Finder search engine that um, you could do something similar. Um, so uh, the, the privacy meter is actually interpreting the, the privacy policy and is giving you this, this privacy score. You could actually personalize that. And we had a version at one point where we did personalize it and say, well, you know, there are lots of things that, that um, you know, Carnegie Mellon says are bad privacy, but I don't really care about those. These are the ones I care about. And I want to see you know, a big, big red X next to it if, if it has any of these things. So, yeah? At a high level between the nutrition one and the privacy is that there's recommendations in one. And because their government's made recommendations for the US. Oh, for good nutrition. Or whatever the recommendations yeah. are. And, and to, I don't think until someone makes this a set of what. Like until someone's telling me, hey, this isn't recommended, I don't know if we can ever get people to agree on if they should agree or not. If I just scan down, I look at anything that's above like 10%, I'm like, and I look over to see what it's telling me about. They told me like nine grams of protein. Um, right, right. But I know that's ten percent of what I have in the day. Yeah. Until yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, and and that's that's part of why we've paired it with the privacy meter, is because you can look at the privacy meter, and the privacy meter says this is great privacy, and then you can go look through and go, okay, well they said it was great privacy. I guess this is you know good. Or the privacy meter says this is bad privacy, all right, now you can see why it's bad privacy. Um, but it's a little bit less immediate than the nutrition label where you put it right there. 
is the meter just a static thing you did for testing, or is that? Um, no, we actually are computing it dynamically by analyzing the P3P policy against we have a, our own opinion as to you know, what's good privacy, and we just compare it against that. Like the nutrition label, that's quite measurable. But the price is your opinion, which presumably would differ depending on who you ask. So I think that's a very big Well, no, actually, the nutrition label is also differs depending on who you ask. When they tell you that this is, you know, 10% of the recommended da daily value, that's for a person of a particular size and weight, which you probably aren't. But the percentage are probably don't vary, right? A percentage, if, if it's 2,000 versus 5,000, percentage would just move along with it. If you're a weightlifter, it does, right? You want more protein. Yeah, you would just multiply the percentage by whatever. Well, the, no, but I, I think the, the point is so that, that it's, 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 you should personalize the nutrition information, that you shouldn't just take it as is. And the same thing for the privacy. You might say, you know, I don't really care about junk mail. It's telemarketing, the only thing I care about. So I'm going to ignore the, the you know, junk mail column, and I'm only going to focus on telemarketing. And, yeah. So, so uh, when you're looking at making a determination of what is a good or a bad practice, I, I, I could think you could take a particular type of information collection and you could say, well, is that information collection good or bad? Is the, the configurable choice by the user good or bad? Is there, is there a choice? And then what is that default option? So is all three of those aspects going into the analysis of what's a good or bad privacy practice? Or are you sort of siloing? each of those are maybe just looking at the information collection. Uh, we're doing the cross product. So, so we're, we're, we're looking at what information is collected and how it's used. All right, so let, let me um, just kind of wrap up here and then I'll continue talking with those of you who have questions here. Um, all right, so the, um, the layered policy, um, as I mentioned before, did not perform well in our study. Um, we found that it performed very similarly to the full policy. Um, some of the big uh, problems were that um, the layered policy actually doesn't have all the information. Um, and people didn't realize when information was missing. Um, and so they would, they would answer a question that required actually clicking through to the full policy without clicking through to the full policy. Um, and yet they would still guess at it. I, I'll, I'll hold your question to the end. Um, and, uh, and, and basically the layered policy is only standardized a little bit. The, um, the layered headings are standardized, but the actual rest of the content of the layered is not standardized. And so it, it really um, is not actually helping very much. Okay. Um, so uh, our ongoing work um, at this point um, is that uh, we, we actually have now finished the, the integration into Privacy Finder. Um, and uh, we're now working on trying to make it the label interactive so that you can come and click on this cell and now find out exactly what's, what's going on um, at that, uh, that website. So what, what, what are they doing with this combination of purpose and type of data? Um, and we're also experimenting with things like the tabs that I mentioned. Um, we'd like to do some field studies to see how people actually use this um, when, when this is their search engine. Um, and we would really love to test this with a major search engine. Hint, hint. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, because you know we can test it in our lab with a few hundred people. We may be able to maybe if we if we uh, you know find ways to bribe them, we can get maybe a thousand people to come use our search engine. Um, but it would be great if we had you know twenty thousand people, um, a very small fraction of a major search engine's population that we could um, that we could test it with. All right, so um, I will end it there. Um, this URL, this is our lab website, and um, all of the papers that I mentioned and many, many more are available there, so you can check those out. And now I'll take a question in the back. So uh, beyond the work you've done here, which is really good work, um, you actually, I don't know if you use this word or not, but um, I would agree with you, whatever using what words you did, that it's mitigation for, I think, what are fundamentally broken models in the first place. I mean, you know, just the whole concept of a certificate and a certificate provider, you know, we've been struggling with that since the dawn of time with regard to the internet. Are, are you, your folks going to do anything in that area about, well, what if the world were completely different and we weren't dependent on these mechanisms we have today? Yeah, I think we're, we're starting to think along those lines as well. Um, it's always harder to think out of the box, you know, that way, but that's, that is, um, uh, I, I think, 
where I'm trying to get my students to think um, and, and trying to come up with some of these more creative, uh, different types of approaches. Yeah. So in the list of things on your nutrition label are things that probably mean a lot to users, like my personal information, my financial, but there was also an element of cookies. What do they think that means? <laughs> yeah, we actually um, are doing another study right now that, that's, that's looking at that. So um, the, the choice of what, it, what those uh, terms are in the, are in the um, grid, you know, there were many more P3P terms we could have thrown in there, and we collapsed things down. And what ended up staying were either concepts that were clearly important to people, um, or, you know, or you know, if we found a bunch of things that were very similar, we, we put them together. Cookies is something that it seems like People who know about cookies, they want to know, do they have cookies or not? So it seemed like it needed to be there. Um, we've, we've been doing studies where um, we ask people, um, what do you think a cookie is? And getting some very interesting responses. Um, there, there is actually a large fraction of the population that now knows what a cookie is, um, but, but it's not by any means you know, like 90% or anything like that. Um, and then when you start getting to things like third party cookies or flash cookies, you know, all bets are off. Um, they, they don't know at all. So I'm happy to have more questions. I think you're happy to have more questions. But let's thank Laurie. So,